Alex Brown, um, please, University of South Australia, exploring and overcoming type 2 diabetes mellitus inequalities in indigenous, indigenous people. Welcome. 15 minutes. Uh, I think it's 45. Oh my God. I'm I could sorry. do it in 15, but you're just going to have to hold on to your pants. <laughs> It was a very kind rush. Uh, look, thank you very much, uh, certainly to the organising committee for giving me a chance to speak today. But I'd like to probably more importantly acknowledge my Māori and Pacific Islander brothers and sisters in the audience and those who weren't able to make it. It's a great pleasure always to be here with you. It re-energises me and reminds me of how important it is for us to look after each other when fighting all of the crap that we fight day in, day out in our lives. Um, I also have a couple of disclosures to declare um, before kicking off my talk. Uh, firstly, I'd like to apologise. I'd be the first and only Australian to go on the record to say sorry about the cricket <laughs> and, and the behaviour of the Australian team in 2015. I thought it was deplorable and as a long-standing member of the Cricket Tragic Clubs of Australia, I was appalled. I was very happy that we smashed you. I was very, very unhappy in the way that we did it, but in some sort of calm, um, uh, approach to prospective suffering that we've uh, had, uh, we bring you the wallabies and have done so for the last decade. <laughs> and I hope that makes up for it. And I, you know, as, as an Indigenous person, I, I just can't hate the All Blacks, uh, and it's largely because of all the brothers and sisters, well, all the brothers playing there. Um, so I can't even hate the guys that smash us consistently. All right, let's go. Why we're interested in Indigenous inequalities was largely because we have a moral, an ethical and a scientific um, responsibility to care for those most vulnerable in our community. In Australia, as many of you would know, it's Indigenous Australians that fare worst on pretty much every marker than you care to imagine measuring. This is a pretty simple slide. Many of you who have heard me talk before will have seen this slide before. I haven't updated it, I haven't changed it, largely because the data has changed very little in the last 15 years. If we look at the age of death of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians, it is a massive bulge that occurs at middle ages. This, this period between the ages of, say, 25 and 55 is the peak age of mortality for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians. This is markedly different to the uh, age of death profile that we see for non-Indigenous Australians who are fortunate enough to live uh, very long uh, lives and predominantly healthy lives. That is clearly not the case for our communities. And if you cut away what drives this high mortality burden at middle ages, it's really chronic diseases that accounts for all of the action. If you slice away the life expectancy differentials, which are significant between our communities and those of mainstream Australia, you'll see the chronic disease looms large as the primary driver of life expectancy inequalities. In fact, it accounts for something like 80% of the difference in life expectancy trajectories for our communities. And the single largest contributor to that is cardiovascular disease, accounts for a third of the life expectancy gap by itself, and that's why most of our work is focused on cardiovascular inequalities in our community. And so when people ask, why are you interested in chronic disease? It's because if we want to get on top of inequalities, uh, life expectancy differences is a pretty important uh, point to start with. And what are we facing in Australia? This is departmental data in and of itself, uh, and they're usually very reticent to provide this sort of information in public fora in Australia, largely because Australians are very bad at having hard conversations. It looks like the gap between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians in terms of chronic disease mortality is expected to widen over time. And this is uh, completely intolerable. What do we know about diabetes in our communities? Well, quite a lot in terms of prevalence, but not a lot in terms of what in God's name we're going to do about it. And we'll try and touch on a couple of those pathways uh, in, the, in the minutes ahead. We know we suffer from significantly elevated rates of diabetes in our communities. 98% of the diabetes we see in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people is type 2. Uh, we are now starting to see extremely high rates in youth and adolescents. We're uh, starting to diagnose children under the age of 10 with type 2 diabetes. And when we start dialysing Aboriginal children because of end-stage renal failure as a consequence of their diabetes, we'll know that we've lost the race. Um, I, I believe it is important that we have an approach in adulthood 
it is not too late, but as people who think about generation to generation and our connectedness across time, we can't ignore one in favour of another because you can't grow up kids without adults. What do we know about the prevalence of diabetes in other Indigenous populations and the differentials or inequalities that we see uh, in other communities, in other nations? Well, the gaps are wide, anywhere you care to look. Indigenous people suffer much higher rates than non-Indigenous people. There is an element of eye of faith to this slide. This is really a descriptive sort of uh, touchstone rather than looking at the prevalence figures themselves, but it would suggest that there are enormous differences that do exist in every population that has a large mainstream population who has dominated Indigenous minorities. What we do see is not just the differences in prevalence, we see differences in mortality burden. You can see here in Australia, and also in New Zealand, despite the fact that we may have slightly smaller differences in prevalence rates to mainstream populations, <coughs> where mortality burden bites hardest is in our two nations. And the difference in mortality between our people Indigenous peoples and the rest of mainstream populations is the most hardest felt in our communities here. This is completely intolerable and this suggests we as a system, as a society, not doing our damn jobs properly. It's a step up. What do we know about the burden in our communities? It's enormous. Whether you look at the risk factors that we carry, or whether you look at the burden of disease as measured, this is work in Central Australia, Alice Springs, where I was based for 14 years. We had uh, a prevalence survey looking at the cross-sectional burden of risk factors and disease in our communities, and it was enormous. This is for Aboriginal men. You can see here, over the age of 65, 100% of the men that we, we saw, whether they were on treatment or not, were still hypertensive. We had extremely high rates of diabetes. Up to 50% of the community over the age of 50 had type 2 diabetes. But we also have extremely high rates of cardiovascular disease and end-stage renal disease. And 85% of end-stage renal disease in our communities is driven by type 2 diabetes. So not only do we have a high prevalence of disease, we seem to suffer the consequences much harder than any other population group in our country. And I think this accounts for the wide disparity in mortality we see from diabetes. We also know that there is differential patterning in the burden of disease across communities. We know that not all communities are the same, that heterogeneity is the rule rather than the exception when it comes to a whole range of features of communities, features of disease, <coughs> patterns, phenotypes, outcomes. So there are differences. It's easy to throw every Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community in a box, which Australian policy does all the time, say they're all bad, they're all screwed, they're all sick, we don't know what to do about it. Catch you later. We know that some communities fare worse than others and we don't target particularly well interventions to those in highest risk. Largely because our policy framework suggests that all Aboriginal people are high risk and therefore we don't know what we're going to do about it. And this has to change. In South Australia, where I currently am and have been for the last four years, we've undertaken a significant amount of work with the, the Department of Health to really get a handle on what's going on in diabetes in that community. We know the prevalence is extremely high in South Australia, as it is in Central Australia, where I last work, worked. We know very high rates over the age of 50, as I suggested. Much higher rates in remote communities. The reasons for this disparity is unclear in totality, but we do know that it's likely to have something to do with access to food, and healthy foods in particular, but also the burden of inflammatory diseases or infectious diseases, although the evidence on that isn't yet clearly defined. We know that it drives significant mortality rates, significant hospitalisation rates, and these are high and elevated at much greater disparity across all ages for Indigenous people in this jurisdiction. But it's not just the burden of prevalence that is of concern, as I mentioned before, it's the burden of complications. We know that diabetes is a potent driver of atherosclerotic disease, particularly in Aboriginal women in our communities. It's largely the most potent driver of coronary artery risk in our community <coughs> for Aboriginal women. It's probably smoking in Aboriginal men, but it seems that diabetes plays strongly in Aboriginal women. The reason for these differences are unknown, but we do know, and this is data from Wendy Hoy's group, that if you've got type 2 diabetes, your risk of coronary disease is extremely high, particularly for Aboriginal women over the age of 35. 
why these patterns exist is unclear, but we do know that when we track the burden of acute coronary syndromes in Aboriginal communities or regional hospitals that serve large populations of Aboriginal communities, the gender uh, benefit um, in coronary disease is washed away in Aboriginal women in particular, largely from this. We also know, as I mentioned before, in stage renal disease is an extremely complex and difficult burden to carry by individuals, families and communities, largely because in Australia most dialysis services are provided in regional satellites uh, or centralised metropolitan dialysis units, not with peritoneal uh, or home-based dialysis treatment options. As a consequence, Aboriginal people who need support for their kidney failure have to leave home, have to leave family, have to translocate, have to dislocate, have to disconnect. This has enormous complications in terms of health and wellbeing, uh, let alone outcomes from a treatment modality. We know, as I mentioned before, 80, 85 per cent of end-stage renal disease in Aboriginal communities comes as a consequence of type 2 diabetes, and the figures continue to rise. We also know potent impact on eye health that diabetes has in our communities. We're less likely to screen for disease, we're more likely to find disease, and diabetic retinopathy occurs in about 30% of Aboriginal people with diabetes from national survey data that we do have, and it's really, uh, we have 14 times the rate of blindness that's due to diabetes compared to mainstream Australians. So it really is the leading cause of preventable blindness in our communities. Despite this, Australia spends a lot of money on trachoma, which hasn't blinded anyone for the last 20 years, as far as I'm aware, and we spend no money on diabetic retinopathy and care for that. Anyway, hopefully that'll change. So I've given you the sort of the hard story, the hard end of what in God's name is happening with the burden of disease in our communities. What are some of the determinants? Well, we probably can't cover all of them, but we should talk, talk through a few of them if we're going to identify solutions. We know that in remote Australia, it's really hard to afford healthy food. It's really hard to access healthy food. And these are the communities with double the burden of disease and uh, a quarter of the relative household income, and they pay four times as much for the food that we demand that they take as medical practitioners to reduce their risk of complications from diabetes or from developing diabetes. So they're basically suffering a triple blow before we even get in the door. We ask them to eat healthy fruit and vegetables. We know that it costs an enormous amount. And most people, if you'd look at a standard healthy food basket for an average family in a remote community, the entire household income would be spent within four days of a fortnight pay cycle on that healthy food basket. We expect people to eat if they can't afford it. If you look here, this is data tracking over time. The places where food is most expensive are in the places that can least afford it. But this is the face of inequality and disadvantage across the globe. Those who have the least resourcing to respond are always bashed with the most difficult of circumstances. And what do we know about people's purchasing choices when they have money or when they don't have money? If you look at some data from Julie Brimblecombe and, went, and uh, Kieran O'Day and colleagues from the Northern Territory, they looked at store data purchase, and what they found is people bought things that had the highest bang for the least buck. When you live in poverty, you know that you have to make that dollar go as far as you can. If you know that you're not going to eat for three days, you're going to eat a pie because a pie will last you for 24 hours. It will fill that hole in your hunger for that period of time. So when we ask why do Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, particularly in remote communities, eat the wrong food, it's because one, they can't afford to eat the food that we demand of them, and secondarily, you're going to get the most bang for buying the crap food with the highest energy for the least amount of money. And you can see here that's exactly where people spend most of their cash. <coughs> we also need to talk about context. Now, people often say to me in Australia, why are you talking about colonisation? This is now the year 2016, 17. That stuff doesn't play out in any way, shape or form. The reality is it does because the way in which things <coughs> played out changed our lives forever. It changed our society forever. It changed the way we operated forever. And it 
took away any sense of us controlling our destiny from us, which was always what we had. So pre-colonisation, just to sort of take you through the sort of epidemiological transition mantra on this, Aboriginal people in Australia were largely very nomadic, although there is now evidence to su suggest some communities actually had an agricultural base. We were very dispersed. We probably had a low life expectancy. We probably died from conflict and infectious diseases. Through colonisation and conflict, there were some changes. We were exposed to diseases we didn't recognise. There were exposure to domesticated animals, most of whom were brought in. We were depopulated directly and indirectly. We were dispossessed of land and the currency of the day in New South Wales, particularly the first colony, was one of alcohol or rum. Through the process of assimilisation, what happened then was another layer of changes. Our societies were reorganised. There was congregation and conflict. We'll move all of the black folk into these tiny reservations that no one wants to open up for pastoral activity. These were communities who had never lived together before. As you can expect, you bring 30 mobs together, it's going to be some drama. That's life. But there were significant nutritional impacts. We were no longer able to get the stuff we used to, no longer to care for that country in a way that preserved the future for us and our kids in terms of things that they would access and eat regularly. There were lifestyle changes in terms of sitting down versus being extremely physically active throughout the process of having to chase your food, often over 20 or 30 kilometres. Sort of makes you a little healthy. But our culture was reorientated and reorganised too. And there were significant impacts on the environment. The environment and our symbiotic relationship to it has always been poorly understood by policy and poorly understood by non-Indigenous people. The land is us. You hurt the land, you hurt us. It can't be any simpler than that. And we carry the scars of what happens to our country. Also by putting a whole bunch of people in a room who's changed their diet and have been exposed to a whole bunch of other people that they never really had a lot of time for, there are favourable transmission dynamics. 30 people living in a house, one group A streptococcal strain, hello baby. We know that group A strep are very good at quorum sensing and they like to party on when there's other group A strep around and they sort of charge on together. This is bad for news. And this, then there's the psychosocial impacts. And as a consequence from this, we're now seeing this delayed transition from an infectious disease life to a non-communicable or chronic disease life, and what we're actually suffering is both at the same time. Sorry, that, was, uh, that slide took me longer to get through than I thought. So what's going on here? You're feeling sad and depressed? <laughs> you might be suffering from capitalism. We haven't talked about the industry and food uh, necessarily quite as much as I thought we may. But once food production became a global commodity for profit, the world changed forever. Or perhaps you're suffering from something far worse. We've always asked the question, could psychosocial factors play, at least in our understanding of what we should do to overcome inequalities in health for disadvantaged and particularly indigenous communities? And for those of you who are not from Australia, this is a cartoon based on a, probably one of the, one of the best ever AFL footballers, a guy called Adam Goods, who called out racism on a football field and was basically dealt with savagely by the Australian population. Because we don't have hard conversations in Australia. You can't call out racism because it's naughty. Go and stay where you are in your corner. You're not welcome to talk about the things that matter most. And it was appalling the way in which the community came out in support of racism against a great Australian who had won two years before that, the Australian of the Year. So what do we know about stress and worry in our communities? Well, don't have to tell Māori or Pacific people in this room about how stressful our lives are as Indigenous peoples. But often we spend a lot of time trying to inform non-Indigenous peoples about the reality of the stress and worry that we face on a daily basis. This is just an, a window into the lives of Aboriginal men in Central Australia. We ask them. Do you get a good night's sleep? Thirty percent of men never get a good night's sleep that we spoke to. Something very simple and very basic. Do you get support when you need it most when you're in trouble? Thirty percent of men said no, they never get support when they need it most. 
This was at a time when people were saying there was no such thing as racism in Central Australia, in Alice Springs where I was working, and that people who talked about racism were talking down the town. We asked Aboriginal men, did they experience racism? 30% of men said they experienced it every single day of their lives. What's the impact on this? Immeasurable. And why does this matter? Well, depression and psychosocial factors in Aboriginal communities play. In those that we asked, do you have people close to you who look after you? Those who said no had higher rates of depression. Those who had all of their needs met in life, and we didn't define what they need, those needs were, they were met less likely to be depressed. Those who felt they were treated with respect and were recognised for what they brought to their workplace, to their institution, to their community, to their family, were those who didn't feel that sense of respect and recognition were very much more likely to be depressed. Surprise, surprise. And how does this play out? The single most important cross-sectional, and I'll say that importantly, correlate of obesity in Aboriginal men was depressive symptomatology. Now, this doesn't tell us chicken or egg, causative or not. This tells us nothing beyond if you're trying to talk about obesity in <coughs> Aboriginal communities and you're not talking about psychosocial factors, you need your head read. If you don't take both parts of the story to play, you're not going to solve any problems. What do we know about intergenerational issues? We know that diabetes in pregnancy is becoming increasingly important in our communities. And it's based on some really important data. This is data from Pima Indians in the US, uh, Dana Dabalaya and colleagues. And basically what they found was the children born to mothers who had type 2 diabetes in pregnancy were significantly more likely to develop type 2 diabetes themselves at young age. You can see here in the grey bars, that's the rates of type 2 diabetes at a very young age in kids born to mums who had type 2 diabetes during pregnancy. Now we know from data from Canada, the next generation, that is the kids born to these kids who had mothers who had type 2 diabetes during pregnancy are now shifted 10 years to the left. Their rates are still extremely high, but at the onset is 10 years earlier. We've set up a range of programs in the Northern Territory looking at diabetes in pregnancy. We think it's a really important prevention approach that we should be talking more substantively about in communities and in government policy. We're tracking the rates, we're tracking the children born to these mothers, and we're trying to understand what interventions need to be built from a community perspective. What's happening in type 2 diabetes in South Australia and the jurisdiction I'm at? Well, this is it here. Rising rates over the years to come, and we're very concerned about where that leads. Now, just to give you an idea of some policy and research responses that we're trying to lay out, Australia has just recently developed a national diabetes strategy. Now, this is always important for Aboriginal voices, Indigenous voices to be heard at the table of policy, to be heard at the table of forums, to discuss these matters. We weren't necessarily welcome at this table but we made sure we got there. We fought and received the opportunity to sit with the grown-ups about national policy. Now, I have personally am sick of begging to be allowed to sit at the big table in policy in Australia for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander issues, but it is happening. So we're gonna push on with that. And our approach to this was, the first meeting of this group, I laid out a framework that I wanted to convince all of the people at that, black, white and green, at that table was an Aboriginal agenda that was good for the country, whether people were white, green or black. Not only did I want to sit at the table, I thought it was our chance to actually define what that table looked at, looked like, to define who could sit at that table. Because you'll find when Aboriginal and other Indigenous peoples build the table, it's a better table. It's got more seats. More people are allowed. Whatever food's left over doesn't get thrown in the bin, we take it back to our communities. We have tall tables for kids, we have low tables for tall people, we have big chairs for people like me, and we have skinny ass chairs for people who have skinny asses. <laughs> These are better tables. So what it came of this was a framework for a national strategy which focuses on these goals. 
Prevention, clearly. Australia has disinvested in prevention over the last 10 years, significantly, and that needs to change. Promoting awareness, reducing the complications and improving the quality of life of people with disease. Reducing the impact of pre-existing and gestational diabetes, as I mentioned before, this is a key critical issue. Reducing the impact of diabetes in our communities and other priority groups and strengthening prevention. Now, as is often the case in Australia, policy papers often sit on tables, benches, shelves, collect a lot of dust. We have now finally got an implementation plan that the department agreed to, which waters down virtually all of these measures, with one exception. It seems they've held on to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander objectives. This is good because if we apply those to everyone, we'll have a pretty good national policy. And what do we focus on? We focused on the importance of prevention within primary care. A focus on early years, which you guys have talked about at great length today, and I think appropriately so. Early detection, sustained care and follow-up of diabetes in pregnancy and health promoting environments. It's easy to tell people what you want them to choose. It's a much harder thing to make sure they've got access to all the things you want them to choose. Give people actual choice is not a bad starting point for public policy. In terms of access to care, we thought an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander workforce was central to the future of improving outcomes for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Talk about no-brainers, that's probably the easiest um, to understand of all of them. We care about our communities in a way that other people don't quite get, they can try. There's lots of people who are really good practitioners who are very good partners of ours in that care, that our future relies on us being the people at the forefront of deciding the future of our own communities. We wanted to increase access to multidisciplinary care through workforce development, through training opportunities for Aboriginal people, through streamlining the complexity of the funding mechanisms in Australia for how you uh, compensate service delivery for what they do, increased access to allied health and outreach case management and really defining what works. And then we should measure it. What a miraculous policy idea. We should evaluate and measure what the outcomes are. Who would have thought of that? So, as we expected though, and as I mentioned was the case, we didn't expect a national policy to get a great deal of legs, so we decided what in God's name could we do in South Australia, where I was. Just so happened that we were asked <coughs> to write the policy plans for heart and stroke care for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, for cancer control and for diabetes uh, over the next five years. We got these contracts all on the same day. We were given three weeks to respond to whether or not we wanted the work and we had 12 months to deliver them, which we did on time and under budget. The challenge is how do you deliver three plans all at the same time? This is what the diabetes plan really talked to and as you would imagine, it's pretty consistent with what the national framework said. What we thought was in a jurisdiction, we could try a national policy framework and see how it goes and say, look, this is what we were talking about. Prevention, early detection, management of the complications, focus on diabetes and pregnancy, and then monitoring. Pretty clear, pretty simple, but underlined by a whole bunch of um, essential requirements to deliver good policy in our communities. What we decided to do was develop a consortium. With Crohn's disease, these three plans will deliver them at the same time, led by Aboriginal people for Aboriginal people across an entire state. We had a focus on the, what the plans brought out. They had priorities in each of those areas. But what we tried to do is tie in policy people and service delivery people into the things that matter across each of these three plans. And as you guys would know and can imagine, prevention, continuity of care, access to multidisciplinary support, outreach, rehab, workforce and monitoring. Surprise, surprise. And this will be the architecture that we'll focus on for the next five years in South Australia for Aboriginal people. So what do we know that we don't know that we need answers to? We don't really know what the true drivers of risk of diabetes are in our community. We know that there's lots of things that are likely contributors, but that doesn't necessarily identify for us the key intervention points that are going to make a difference. We know the way in which non-Indigenous people and Western biomedical science understands complexity 
is not necessarily adequate to understand what we know as Indigenous peoples about our context and about our diseases and about our wellness. And we need to reaffirm the importance of understanding what Indigenous peoples know because that will provide a better future for all. We don't really understand the determinants of early onset. We need to understand that better. We don't understand why heterogeneity exists in outcomes, in burden, across communities, but understanding that, and importantly, understanding why some people in our community don't ever suffer from type 2 diabetes is a really important question for us. What is it that they have for all of us to understand better? We need to understand who's going to go poorly so that we can intervene as hard and as fast as possible, and we need to identify what we're going to do about it individually and collectively. One of the bits of work we're keen to progress is a large study of type 2 diabetes in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, largely Aboriginal people in South Australia. We're going to identify, screen and track 4,000 Aboriginal people over the next 20 years. We're going to see them at baseline, a whole range of phenotyping, assessment of markers in blood, genetic work, epigenetic work to understand what clues we can identify to target better interventions to reduce complications in our community. We've already started, we've got the first 400 people through the door. It's hard work and my research field work staff will eventually end up killing me, but it'll be in all the, for good reason. Our conceptual framework for this work is to really understand if there's changes or differentials in phenotype, how is individual characteristics, gene expression and contextual factors relate to this so we can identify better intervention points. But in our communities, you can't just do a research project without delivering a service, nor should we. Disadvantaged people deserve more. So here's our research. We want to do our research thing. Yeah, good luck, buddy. If you're not helping us build better healthcare systems, you're kidding yourself and you're not going to get any people signing up to it, which is exactly what's happened. So we're trying to develop the policy framework around which our interventions and our work in the research space can change policy and practice day to day. Similarly, when you talk to communities, they say, well, the diabetes story is largely about inequality and poverty and disadvantage and toxic external pressures. What do you do about that? So we've just received money from a trust fund to identify social needs in every patient who comes through the door for our research project and support them to access through hardcore advocacy, access to Aboriginal specific programs to support their social needs. What we hope is it delivers a medical benefit. We would also like to extend that work across Indigenous peoples in many other places across the globe. And I'd like to have conversations with people over the years to come about doing so. The last slide really is to just touch on opportunities for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and other Indigenous communities to do work together. This is in many ways, I'm not here to pump pharma in any way, shape or form, but this is a game changing clinical trial in diabetes and cardiovascular health. This is really the first big cardiovascular benefit drug trials in diabetes that's been seen and there's opportunities here for us. This drug, which basically changes the way your kidneys handles the sugar that comes through, in patients who have diabetes and have heart disease, you go on this drug, it reduced your chances of dying from heart disease or being hospitalised for heart failure by almost 40%. Now, in the context of the title of this session, is it too late in adulthood? I don't think it is, because as I mentioned, you need adults to grow up kids, you need grandparents to grow up children. Uh, but waiting till people have diabetes and heart disease may be a little late. Perhaps we can focus on interventions a bit further up the food chain before all these complications play out. That's what we're interested in. We can't do that alone. We want to do that with our Indigenous brothers and sisters right across the globe and because the reason's too important not to. Uh, inequality is intolerable. I'm sick of talking about it. I'm sick of these slides. People say, you're always so doom and gloom, Alex. Yeah, you guys only have to listen to this talk once. I have to give it all the time and it really gets to you eventually. <laughs> and the reality is, we've all got skin in this game. This isn't data. This is my family. This is me. This is our communities. 
So we do need a hand, but you need to look, let us do it on our terms. And uh, finally, um, people always say, why are you so ambitious here, Alex? Surely you can't get it done. Yeah, maybe. If you don't ever think the unthinkable, you'll never achieve the unachievable. But I can't do that without you guys. So thanks. That was good fun. Good luck. Thank you very much, uh, Alex. Quite a memorable and, and a moving presentation, so I appreciate that. We have actually almost 10 minutes for questions, so you'll be happy to answer, yeah, of course. Please, from the floor. Please. Hello. Um, uh, thank you, Alex. That was a really good presentation, although you know, moving, yes, but um, I was really struck by the, the slide of the um, socioeconomic effect on buying people's food, like their food choices and the amount of energy that came from different foods. And it reminded me that the um, pre-colonial diet of indigenous Australian people was very high in animal protein, very low in starch and sugar, no added fats, no added sugars, of course, and um, they're having a few short, you know, small studies where returning people to their traditional diets reverse diabetes. So with that in mind, is it appropriate that indigenous people in Australia or perhaps other places are given the same general dietary advice as the, as the rest of the population? Just a minute. Do I need to uh, repeat that question or did you hear that? I was told by the um, directors of... Sorry? Please repeat. I think, Alex, the question was, and you might repeat my repetition of the question, was uh, putting aside the preamble, is it appropriate to give um, same advice to Indigenous, non-Indigenous people, something like that? Yep. Thank you. Look, um, I mean, unfortunately, you're asking the wrong person this question. I mean, Karen O'Day is clearly the, the person who would answer this better than I. Um, the reality is we probably don't know the answer to that. Um, we do know that dietary changes have wrought significant impacts on our communities. We do know that reversion, which was the work that Karen O'Day did, reversion for Indigenous people back to country and back to their traditional diet was associated with a great deal of positive cardiometabolic changes, which for anyone who understands our communities will go, yeah, of course. It was, a, it was a, a, an expected outcome. The challenge is how do you then modify that to a population health intervention of substance. Now, dietary guidelines may be one of the tools in that, but we, we simply don't know um, whether or not the dietary advice we give to mainstream communities is the same advice we should give to any ethnic minority group who may have different needs, different histories of diets and what have you. I think from, from an outsider's perspective, I would say to the nutritional guidelines people of the world, please make it simple. It's really hard for us to communicate to our patients anything in the biomedical sphere, let alone where well, you could have this proportion of saturated fat and reduce your sugar content by about this much and should make up no more than 10 to 50%, depending on whose evidence you read. It's really hard for us to do our job as people on the ground. And I would just beg, it's, I don't care if it doesn't exactly work for this ethnic group or that, but please, you guys, stop fighting about what the nutrition guidelines should be and give us some clarity so that we can help support our families and patients. And the two bits of advice that we tend to give people is, if your grandma doesn't know what it is, don't eat it. If it's got more than four elements in it, don't buy it. And that's about as good as we can do. Thank you. Uh, another question? Please. Um, hello, Alex. Louise Bauer from oh, the yes. University of Sydney. Thank you so much. I was wondering if you could talk about a couple of things. Um, I was wondering if you could talk about physical activity and the options that, how that might play within the uh, Indigenous community in Australia. Uh, sorry for the pun. And the second one was to talk about um, urban Aboriginal communities, which actually make up the largest number of Aboriginal people in Australia, and what the strategies or issues there might be. Two so questions. One was about physical activity and uh, urban indigenous people in Australia, the largest group apparently. Thank you, Louise. Look, um, what do we know about physical activity in Aboriginal people and Aboriginal communities? Well, not a great deal, but probably from national survey data or specific focus on these sorts of questions in, in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities is that it's not a great deal different. 
So it clearly wouldn't account for the massive differentials we see in burden of disease. So that's one part to it. In our experience, we have, and I think there was a number of conversations talking about adolescence and transitions today. The transition in adolescence for Aboriginal communities that I've worked in, and I'll speak largely to those, is even more complicated because part of the complexity is the role transition in adolescence for Indigenous kids. The transition to adulthood happens at a truncated scale and it's involved with a range of cultural factors which play to define where people are in that transition. What we see is young men in particular, or young males, continue to be relatively physically active for significant periods of time, but young Aboriginal girls or women become much more sedentary much more earlier and disengage from the sporting environment which is where most of the physical activity comes in Aboriginal communities. So we see a divergence between the sexes and we see a more truncated transition role to adulthood which is associated probably on many factors with some more sedentary lifestyle behaviours. In terms of the differences that exist in urban compared to remote Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities are absolutely right. The vast majority of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people live on the eastern seaboard of Australia in large metropolitan environments or large regional centres. They don't live in remote Australia. But poverty bites no matter where you live. It doesn't matter if you're an impoverished Aboriginal person in remote Australia or an impoverished Aboriginal person in a large um, metropolitan environment living next to a hospital, you still may have trouble accessing care, right? Because the things that drive inequalities for marginalised people is part geographical, but very little of it in terms of the totality of that context. In terms of what interventions work in those places, well, price still plays. Poverty still plays in terms of what people can afford to purchase. And we've let most of our communities down in terms of the way in which we give them those information on which to make choices and then choices that they can choose. So even though some of the context is different, the challenges are similar. That's a very poor answer to a very important question. Um, we started a few minutes late, so I'll just take one more pressing question. Uh, Wayne? Um, Alex, a wonderful presentation. I heard you speak last year and the data was heroin then and it's as heroin today as it was then. Um, now, you, you clustered rural and urban and remote together, but are there lessons to be learned if you unbundle um, rural and remote? Because my suspicion is that rural and remote Northern Territory may be different to Western Australia or South Australia. So yep. are, there, are there differences and are those informative in terms of NCR? Yeah, so the question was, are there differences, geographical differentiators between regional, remote, metropolitan communities in terms of diabetes prevalence? Well, yeah. NCDs. In non-communicable diseases and what lessons there are for us. Is that a reasonable yeah. solution? So if we look at psychosocial factors, we know that psychosocial factors like stress, grief and loss and racism exposure suicidal ideation, depressive rates, are much higher in metropolitan circumstances. So what we see in mortality differences is there's actually higher mortality for Aboriginal people in metropolitan living. So we think that all the bad stuff happens in remote Australia. The highest burden of mortality for Aboriginal people in Australia is, is largely in these large regional centres or in metro. And they seem to die more likely from a cardiovascular profile. I carry a, what looks like an atherogenic risk factor background. That's how it looks. But it's seen, it's always been considered some sort of unusual paradox. When you look at renal disease and diabetes, much higher rates in remote Australia. And that's why I touched on maybe this is in terms of nutritional access or maybe it's the inflammation story. We simply don't know. I think the more important question for us will be, even though it looks like psychosocial factors are driving high mortality in metropolitan circumstances. That's in my experience. Um, the lessons are from people who are protected, no matter what circumstance they live in. We've never done a study of understanding the health and well-being and longevity of Indigenous peoples, right? But it'd be a fascinating project to do from a social science perspective as well as from a biological perspective. Why is it, despite being exposed to all of these risks, that seem to take out a whole bunch of us. Why do people make it through? How are they resilient? 
when all decks are stacked against them. I think that's where the next generation of our understanding of heterogeneity in communities will be an important thing for us to look forward to. I'll not leave it there. Thank you very much, uh, Alex. I appreciate your... Uh, <laughs>